Welcome and uh, appreciate all the folks who obviously sat on the right side of the room today as opposed to the few brave souls who sat on the wrong side of the room today. Oh, no, but uh, at any rate, it's, 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 great to, it's great to have you all uh, here. Very thankful uh, as well to be able to welcome with us uh, Brian Alexander. Uh, my name is James Olson. I uh, work in our Office of Academic Services and uh, teach in philosophy here. And I, Brian has a very distinctive appearance. You might think that he was right off of a homestead from the state of Vermont. And the, the reason might in part be because Brian is off of a homestead uh, from the state of Vermont. Nonetheless, he is as technologically connected and advanced and engaged as, as anybody I know, and certainly an expert on, on those areas. We're, we're very happy to welcome him. Just to uh, read a little bit from his bio here, to let you know a little bit more about who we're going to be listening to today. Uh, Brian Alexander is an internationally known and award-winning futurist, as well as a researcher, writer, speaker, consultant, and professor. He's working in the field of how technology transforms education. And while education is his area of specialization, I will also say that he's one of those rare individuals who is conversant on many, many topics. He completed his English language and literature PhD at the University of Michigan in 1997 with a dissertation on doppelgangers in romantic era fiction and poetry. In addition to his work in academia at Centenary College of Louisiana and most recently at Georgetown University, Brian has worked for nonprofits and as a consultant in higher education since 2002. He also speaks widely, publishes frequently, with articles appearing in numerous venues, including the Atlantic Monthly and Inside Higher Ed. He's been interviewed by and featured in the Washington Post, MSNBC, US News and World Report, National Public Radio, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the National Association of Colleges and University Business Officers, Pew Research, Campus Technology, and the Connected Learning Alliance. Uh, as well, for anyone interested in the kinds of topics in higher education that Brian pursues, it's well worth, uh, you, you kind of have, you, you know, it's a little bit later in the evening for us here in Qatar, but the Future Trends Forum happens every Thursday in which he uh, interviews such luminaries as Audrey Waters, Anya Kamenetz, and Cable Green uh, on, on a wide range within higher education. On the bright side, if you're like me and it's a little harder to, you know, stay up and watch those, you can always watch them uh, afterwards. Those are always captured. I uh, will just say uh, in conclusion that he, he, he recently published Universities on Fire, Higher Education in the Age of Climate Crisis. So for any of you like me interested in, in the topic of, of uh, climate change, I think it's an important text for us. Uh, his previous book, Academia Next, The Futures of Higher Education, won the 2020 Association of Professional Futurists Most Significant Futures Works Award for analyzing a significant future issue and was named one of Forbes' best higher education books of 2020. Uh, we are grateful to be able to welcome and engage with Brian in this critical discussion concerning AI's impact in higher education and how we can best respond during this time of change. Brian. <laughs> people right now. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, very good, very good. Um, and I'm gonna quickly take a picture of you all, just so people believe me when I say, here I am in, in Qatar. Yes. I want to thank Jamie and his team as well for uh, bringing me here halfway around the world and treating me so nicely, um, giving me the opportunity to meet so many people, especially students. Uh, I'm really grateful to the whole team and also to the students who showed up. Um, I'm glad you could do that. Uh, what I'm going to be doing right now is talking to you about the future of higher education. And I'll be doing that in a few different ways. Uh, first of all, uh, I am always supposed to be answering the question of what happens next. 
what's coming up down the road. Uh, and I do this as a futurist. And as a futurist, I have many diff people have different associations with what that means. Uh, I'm really fond of the, uh, the wizard part and the magic, you know, magic ball. Um, but really what I do is uh, I help people think about the future um, through research, through creativity, and through trying to assemble the puzzles of a giant mystery. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides here because you have already talked about them. What I'm going to do now is talk to you about what trends are reshaping higher ed. This is a classic futures tool. So we take a look at forces in the present and in the recent past that we can document with lots of evidence and then extrapolate those ahead into the future and then try to see what that means for higher ed going next. As I go, I'm gonna cover a lot of topics in a hurry. So if you want me to revisit one of them at the end, please let me know and I'd be glad to say more. So I, I like to start with big picture uh, as a whole. I like to take a look at the entire Earth system and we're gonna to return to that at the very end. But there are some of the forces that are impacting us that are really global at scale. And one of them has to do with the gigantic, universally adopted idea that we need to improve the quantity of people taking classes in higher ed and we need to improve the quality of that experience. And I have found this in every nation on Earth. That nobody thinks we have enough people, just we can stop educating. And nobody thinks we are doing it perfectly and we should stop improving. This twofold impression is very, very deep and very strong. The US has just gone backwards on one of those, which I'll talk to you about in just a minute. Oops. Now, another key trend about this globally has to do with what I call the international university strategy. And this is the idea that a given campus should be considered as a kind of nexus of the world. That if you set foot on a campus, you should be able to encounter multiple ethnicities, multiple religions, multiple languages, and that in fact it should be like a node of the global culture, a crossroads of the global economy. And the reasons for this are manifold and they date back to 1990, if not older, but this is definitely a major force. Or as I now will tell people, it's called you know, Qatar, um, because you have all been doing this and you are ahead of every university uh, that I've seen in Europe or in North America trying to do this. Now, the opposite of this drive is also true. There's a push to have campuses focus on a particular nationality, particular culture, or particular re region in order to try to study their local folkways or ways of knowing. Now, some of the purposes, some of the drivers behind this are very political. Uh, and you can see already uh, several uh, ex-national leaders. Um, but this also appears within academia itself. Uh, for example, while many places, like the uh, education city here in Qatar, have the idea of using English as the language of instruction, you can see countries where academics have pushed back against that, most recently in South Africa and in Holland. The idea being that if you're going to go to that university, you should really soak up more of that particular culture. In fact, most recently, Canada just went massively into reverse on the score. Canada per capita has housed more international students than any country in the world. But just this past week, they decided to stop doing that and reverse it. And they're actually gonna cut down the number of international students they take in. I mean, personally, I think this is a terrible idea, but it's simply part of it. It's that national college idea. Serve the locals instead. A third global trend I'd like you to think about has to do with global geopolitical instability. And I feel stupid saying that here in the Middle East, you know, obviously, right? But I, I want to unpack this a little bit. Uh, what you see here on the screen is a term that I've seen from the military, both from NATO and the United States, called VUCA, a world which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, i.e. one that's very, very hard to forecast, one that's hard to work with. And you can see this already playing out in many, many different directions. The biggest single geopolitical factor of our time is the gigantic Cold War 2.0 between the United States and China, which has already impacted most of the world. What you see here is just one schematic of the one belt, one road idea. Um, we could talk about this if you like, but the reason I'm mentioning this is because one belt, one road is a commercial enterprise, a strategic enterprise, but also one built in higher education where China is trying to encourage more students from all these participating nations to participate in Chinese higher education. And the US is trying the opposite, trying to encourage more students who aren't from China to come to the United States. 
And this is playing out also in law enforcement, where we had the American government prosecute some people for being, allegedly, Chinese espionage agents. And in fact, the Canadian government, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago, their Supreme Court recently handed out a decision saying that any university could reject any applicant from any country if they think they are likely to commit espionage. So the Cold War has already started to hit higher education. We can go further still. There are a couple of other conflicts, notably now in its second year, the war between Russia and Ukraine, which had all kinds of interesting impacts in higher education. There were scholars who wanted to rethink Russian literature and language as uh, perhaps as a handmaiden of Russian imperialism. There were, of course, ties broken between Russia and many, many other countries in academia. And now a lot of European, North African, and North American academics were trying to host or save or otherwise help Ukrainian academics. And naturally, I don't have to tell you about the war in Gaza, which is going on right now. And again, this has had impacts for everything from academics killed or wounded or displaced in Gaza to naturally the connections between this conflict and academics around the world. So we have this VUCA world of increasing instability. And I think I've given you a taste of how it impacts higher education. There are other knock-on effects but now I want to talk about perhaps the most powerful tool in the futurist toolbox. And a quick show of hands, how many of you are over 45 years old? So those of you who are not over 45 years old, you see the hands I'm like, yeah, yeah, and this is it, right? So I'm proudly to say, you know, I'm gonna be 57 in a couple of weeks, right? And the reason I'm asking that is because my generation and older were trained on the idea that the human, human race was overpopulating that we're filling up the world with babies, and this is gonna be a great, great crisis. And that shaped us for a generation. And it shaped many, many people, including the Chinese government, lots of forces, but it turns out to be completely wrong. You see, what's happened instead, demographically, is something that is actually unprecedented, that we have not yet experienced before. Let me explain. What you're seeing here is a, is a demographic map of right now, or in 2020, Nigeria. And this is also what human history looked like until about the year 1900. What you see is horizontal lines. Each one of those is a different age group. So on the very bottom, kids age zero to four, then five to nine, then 10 to 14, and so on. And at a glance, you can see that this is a society that produces tons of babies, and then mortality sets in fast and hard. So you have more kids than teenagers, more teenagers than people in their 20s and so on, so you have only a very few elders. And again, this is what human history looked like for millennia until about 1900. This pyramid was what humans looked like. And now this is what we're doing instead. That pyramid's flipped upside down. This is Germany in 2020, but there are a lot of other examples. You can see there are more teenagers than kids, more people in their 30s and their 20s, and we know exactly how and why this happened. It happened because of modernity. Any society that goes through modernization proceeds through this process almost without exception. That is, if you increase uh, a nation's wealth, if you increase its health care and public health, and especially if women get more access to reproductive capacity, the labor market, and education. Higher education plays a decisive role here. Once you do that, women will have fewer and fewer kids, and people will live longer and longer lives. Fewer and fewer kids, more and more seniors. And this has happened almost without exception. You can see it happening right now in midstream. So here's Ecuador. You can see 20 on up, and you can see the classic pyramid, but now that pyramid is being reversed right away. You can see this in the United States, and the US is weird because we have so much immigration, and immigrants tend to be very young. If you remove immigration from the US, like a certain presidential candidate wants to do, if you did that, our population would start shrinking right away. Qatar right now has an unusual demographic profile, but you can see in the male side here, you can see that shape already, that pyramid reversed. Now, this is happening unevenly across the world because not all nations have gone through modernity at the same pace and the same kind of way. You can see here that the nations that are yellow or orange, um, those are the ones that are already producing fewer and fewer kids. And you can see them throughout most of the United States, most of Europe, a lot of Asia, notably China. I mean, little kids growing up now 
will not think of China as the most populous nation in the world, because it's not. It's a big change. But the countries that are blue are the ones that are still producing kids. In fact, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. You can see that most of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. We have quite a few here in the Arabian Peninsula. We also have Pakistan, uh, less importantly Afghanistan because there's fewer people to begin with, a little bit in Southeast Asia, but in many ways, the demographic future of the 21st century is in sub-Saharan Africa. And you're starting to see signs of that. You're starting to see more NGOs reaching out to partner with high schools and primary schools in Africa. This is very, very important when it comes to where we recruit international students from. Here's a hint. Very few students coming out of Russia, fewer still coming out of Europe, for example. But also this matters when it comes to, well, how we work in education. So this is a map of the US broken down by state, and it uses the same color scheme. And you can see, again, the states that are yellow or orange or red are the ones that are losing population. And one thing you should know is that the Northeast, the fiery red zone, that's where most of American higher education is based. The Midwest, lots of red there and orange, that's our second biggest spot for higher education. Um, you can see right now that Texas is kind of like the, the heart of American fertility, which is really interesting to think about. And if you want comedy, what you have to imagine are very snooty New England colleges trying to market themselves in Texas. I find that endlessly funny, but the reason I'm showing you this is just to remind you that we in higher education often depend on traditional age students, 18 to 22, uh, which is a majority here, I think, in, in, um, in Education City. That pipeline is narrowing, and it's not coming back because nothing has reversed this birth rate trillion decision anywhere in the world. If you want comedy, I recommend that you go to YouTube and look for the Danish government's ads where they try to encourage young Danes to go off and have kids. It's incredibly funny, both intentionally and accidentally, and it didn't work at all. Right? The other thing you want to think about is if that pipeline of traditional age kids is getting smaller, then maybe we need to pivot and teach more and more adults. That's a huge pivot to make. All right, I gotta keep moving. There's still more to talk about. Whoops, sorry, went too far. Another part of the demographic puzzle, and by the reason, the reason I'm talking about demographics so much is because they are baked in. I mean, we know a lot about population. The insurance industry does a ton of research. There's a demographic industry that does this. We know a lot. And unless something truly ha awful happens, then this is what we've got. The other part of this, and this is especially true in the United States, is increasing heterogeneity by race. You can see here certain states are increasingly diverse in terms of race. And this has played out in some very, very important ways that have really ricocheted around the world. I don't I think need to dwell too much on this because you already know about this. In the United States, we've had Black Lives Matter and what some call a great awakening, a great awakening about race. In terms of higher education, this has played out all over our institutions in terms of our curriculum, how we staff in terms of representation, our professional development in terms of anti-racist pedagogy, how we handle administration, how we support students, and even our campus grounds down to individual buildings. And the student population is getting different in other ways as well. I mentioned adult learners. Right now in the US, that's about 25 or 30% of the population and likely to grow. We're also having more and more students who are first generation, that is no one in their family went to higher education. We have more students who are veterans, and we have more students with learning disabilities. If you put all those together, this population is more interesting, more complex, and also more expensive to support. Now, in the US, one other thing. I mentioned transformations by demographics. There's a religious transformation going on too, where the US is finally starting to look a bit more like Europe. So if you ask Americans, are you religious? Do you go to church? What is your faith? And so on. The numbers were pretty steady from around 1940 to around 2000. And you can see here that uh, if you ask people, you know, do you go to church? The numbers are in the 70s, 70s, 70s until 2000, and then they fell off a truck. And now the numbers are below half. So America is becoming more and more secular. Why this matters for higher education? We have religious colleges and universities who are gonna to struggle to find more people. We teach and research religion, which is gonna become more and more challenging. Now, on top of that, I just wanna talk about the US for a little bit because we've got an unusual setup when it comes to higher education. And one of the things that we do is we have this commitment that everyone should go to college. 
We started that commitment in the 1960s, and as a result, higher education and enrollment blew up. It just grew like crazy until 2012. And then it stopped. And every year since then, in fact, every semester, total enrollment in American higher education has gone down. Sometimes by a little bit, like 1%, 2%, sometimes by a lot, three, four, five, seven percent So right now, we have really, really sharply declined. Why this matters? First of all, if you want to get everybody some college experience, we're doing something wrong. Second, American higher education is effectively privatized. That is, about one-third of our colleges and universities are private, two-thirds are public, but they get very little money from governments. So, in effect, we depend on students paying tuition in order to keep our doors open. And if we have fewer students, you can see the problem. One more factor here about enrollment, and this is not one that is, I think, unique to the United States. Omar, I was going to ask you if you've seen the great TV show, The Wire. Have you? No, it's on my list. Okay, but you've heard about it because of your name, right? You'll see. Especially season two. You'll see. Okay. Students who actually come to our classes have started changing the majors they take. And what I'm about to show you, I don't think is a great surprise. And I'm showing you this as someone with a PhD in the humanities. And I'm not showing you this to be happy or cruel. I'm just showing you the evidence of what's happening. Basically, students are moving away from the humanities and arts and towards STEM, business, and allied healthcare. This is a chart of uh, degrees given for a decade. And uh, the horizontal line is changes um, to the right is growth, to the left is loss. And I'm not going to read you this whole chart. I'm just going to show you the very, very top. You can see that there is, uh, these are fields that are just booming like mad, fields that are growing by 25, 50, 100, 150%. And we're talking about computer science, nursing, exercise science, computer and exercise science. You see a pattern, right? Now let's take a look at the bottom left. And these are the ones that are declining by 10, 20, 30, 40%. We're talking religion, right? languages other than English, history, area studies, religion and theology. You can see the pattern. And I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm saying this is happening. And it's happening for various reasons we can talk about, and we have to take them into account as we plan. We have to think, for example, do we cut back our humanities, have fewer programs, fewer faculty? Do we shift the humanities away from having full degree offerings and majors to being service units, doing general education? Do we say, heck with it, we need the humanities, we'll keep paying for it even if students don't take it? And do we hope maybe the humanities will come back? Now, I want to push ahead a little bit. I've got a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about economics and then advance. A couple of things to think about when it comes to economics. And man, can he think about anything that doesn't involve numbers? Yes. Um, but macroeconomics here is important because it shapes the world in which our students are going to live, as well as the world that our institutions inhabit. First thing to think about is the decline in most of the developed world away from industry and the shift towards service for work. That is, in the 1990s, we often thought that the workforce of the future would be based on information technology, be based on creativity or information. This has not turned out to be the case. Information technology and creative enterprises employ very, very few people. They make a lot of money, but they actually don't hire that many people. Apple has a very small workforce in the United States, for example. But most of the jobs in most of the developed world are in the service industry, which is interesting and is a shift. Second shift is away from long-term jobs towards short-term jobs which in the US we call the gig economy, and in Australia they call it the American economy. Um, we're also seeing more and more requirements for more technology and work. I mean, this is obvious, but it's worth noting, again, that we're, we're digitizing the workforce in all kinds of ways. Now, we can also talk about another macroeconomic trend, which is a shift in terms of income and wealth inequality. I'm just going to quickly touch on this research because this is very, very important, and this hasn't really been fully addressed. Basically, if you look at a lot of Anglophonic countries, Canada, the US, Britain, Australia, what you can see is that from roughly 1950 to about 1980, we were the least economically unequal we'd ever been. You could think of it as we're kind of not the most economically equal, but just less unequal. In fact, some economists have called this the Great Compression. 
And if you look back at movies and TV, and especially news from that period, take a look at it again with an eye towards macroeconomics. You'll see the rich people don't look that different from everybody else. It's very interesting. But starting around 1980, for reasons that are pretty contradictory and argued over, income inequality took off again. And right now, in the second decade of the 21st century, we are in what a Swiss reinsurance company called Gilded Age 2.0. Now, a Swiss reinsurance company is not a Marxist outfit. Um, they are instead describing investment opportunities, um, and they're hard to argue with. Why does this matter? It matters in part because if we depend on student income for, in order to keep our doors open, this is going to predispose us to try and recruit more and more from wealthier and wealthier families around the world. And this is also potentially going to give those families a greater say over the operations of colleges and universities. This latter point doesn't happen in public very much, but it happens very noticeably among many, many places. In the US, this takes an extra dimension where we get bigger and bigger donations from wealthier and wealthier people. All right, I wanna move on a little bit and just give you one cryptic slide here. This is a fun slide to show because this is a slide that represents a lot of history. This is uh, Governor DeSantis and uh, former President Trump, the one year in which they were friends. And the reason I'm showing you this is because in the United States, the uh, conservatives and the right wing have become extremely anti-higher education. This is actually unusual. They are much more anti-higher than they ever have been. And I'm saying this because this is making it more and more difficult to fund and support higher ed. In fact, since the US is entering this year long uh, election battle, it looks like higher ed is gonna be a major player in this, or at least a major battleground in this. So this is making it more and more difficult to plan and do anything in higher education in the US. All right, I wanna talk about technology, but first let me ask, um, am I going too fast, too slow, is this okay? Okay, I appreciate the thumb. Now let me ask you a quick question, this is a quiz. The picture behind you, uh, behind me, in front of you, uh, is a drone with a chainsaw. Which country first developed this? The chainsaw or the drone? The combination. Good question, the combination. Who would you think? You'd think, right? No. Oh, I, was so, I was so embarrassed when I heard this. Who else do you think? Very close, no. Now, this is Finland, because Finland has a very aggressive uh, technology development uh, sector, and they also have a special relationship with trees. Now, I'm showing you this partly because it's an amazing photo, um, but also just to show you how weird and how rapidly technology is developing. I mean, we all know this, but the more you look at it, the deeper and stranger it becomes. In higher education right now, we're wrestling with a few things we've been wrestling with for a few years that are likely to keep going. One is the question of student data. I don't mean adhering to regulations, we've gotta do that. But in terms of how we extract it, how we use it, to what extent students play a role with it, this is actually pretty controversial. Another is what do we do with the intersection of augmented and virtual reality? Now, we've been fiddling with this for a bit. We've got lots of little pilot projects around the edges. Do you have any, um, uh, HoloLens uh, or Magic Leap experiments here on campus? Uh, we have VR headsets. Okay, okay, so VR, this is a key part of it. So VR is the creation of a virtual world that you can inhabit. Augmented reality is the inverse, where you take the digital world and you pin it to the physical world. Like if you walk around with Google Maps or Waze, right? or you drive with it, which you're kind of not supposed to do, but we do anyway. Right? Aug extended reality is the combination of these. So for example, if I put on an extended reality headset right now, I could see all of you and I could also download information about each of you. I could look at that uh, cabinet series and I could play a computer game where a robot climbs over that towards me and I have to fight it with a lightsaber or something else. Now this has been tried by many companies and it hasn't really taken off but I want you to wait a couple of months because Apple is releasing a tool called the Vision Pro which is attempting it. And because Apple is a planetary behemoth and people love them to death, and they're also pretty good at technology, this might become huge. And the question is, how do you support this on campus? This is a big issue that we're gonna have to think about. I can come back to this and explain more if you like. Uh, another thing to think about is open 
Um, by that, I don't mean happy, open things. I mean specifically open education resources, open access and scholarly publication, and open teaching. These are all not technologies, but they're practices enabled by technology. And as far as we can tell, all of these have been growing. The amount of OER content has really taken off. The amount of open access scholarship is pretty big. And people are sharing more and more teaching through all kinds of technology. Now, if we want to talk about AI, a few things I want to hit. And I hope, uh, is it Dr. Sama? I hope this is as precise as possible. And I will have lots more to say in Q&A if you'd like. First thing to think about is the economic impact. Because this is going to shape a lot of stuff. And I, I mentioned this at a morning meeting, and so if you were there, let me just repeat this really quickly. There are three possibilities ahead. The first is that we will render some jobs obsolete. We will throw some people out of work. But we will produce more jobs, and we'll produce more employment and new jobs as a result. There will be a net gain. And this is what we've done from about the year 1800 to 2000. Like when we invented the car, this was terrible news for people whose job was, say, like servicing horse and buggy. But we built cities. We built planetary networks as a result, right? So it's possible we'll do that. We'll have new jobs like AI ethicist, AI wrangler, AI manager, all kinds of good stuff as a result. That's one possibility. Now, if this is the case, all of us in higher ed have to figure out how to prepare students for those new jobs that kind of don't exist yet. That's a big ask. Second possibility. We break with history, and we lead to unemployment. So for example, this is not necessarily a good time to be a lawyer right now. We can automate a lot of legal functions, legal research, access to justice, contracts. If we do that, we're not going to generate any more jobs. I, I, I know nobody is going to be sad at lawyers suffering. I know, I know. That's impossible, right? Um, but, but that won't lead to any new jobs. Maybe that will be reproduced everywhere else. Maybe we will lead to perpetual 15% unemployment or underemployment. So instead of the normal 40, <clears throat> 50 hour week, we end up working 30. This is another possibility. And if that's the case, then all of you have to think about how you prepare students for that kind of time. Do you have to hyper prepare them for more competitive careers? Do you have to in some way prepare them for downtime? Maybe this is where the humanities comes back. Third possibility is what this picture is about, is that you will work more closely with AI in every job, much like we have automation in almost every job right now. So if you are a lawyer, if you're a political scientist, if you're a biologist, you have to use more and more artificial intelligence in your work. So students going forward will have to figure out how to do this in all of their different fields. So if you're an international studies student, international relations student, what role will artificial intelligence have? We can talk about that. Let's go a little further. And I, I just love AI-generated art because I am the worst artist in this room. Uh, I am notoriously bad, um, and I love being able to make art this way. There are downsides, there are problems of all kinds, but I just love especially the surrealism and weirdness of it that results. Um, how we use this in the classroom, there are a lot of ways. This is one sequence, which I think is a pretty smart one, a pretty basic one. This is from uh, Harvard's uh, education school, uh, in which case any faculty member has to simply formulate the problem they're trying to solve with AI, pick the right AI tool, of which case there are lots of them. Uh, here is a shout out to Robert, because he is awesome and also keeps up on all of these tools, so he's someone to talk to for this. And then to experiment with the AIs, because the AIs are very easy to start using but you have to work with them and develop them and iterate them. And then, above all, reflect on the experience. Uh, where'd Anne go? I just saw. Hello. So you run the, I'm going to get the name of it wrong. Um, is, it's at the Faculty Teaching Forum? Faculty Teaching Learning Forum. Teaching Learning Forum. Thank you. So a venue like that, which I know nothing about other than the simple fact that it exists, sounds like it would be a good place for people to share the kind of work, to do that reflection bit, so that people can know about this. Now. We can talk about some of the different ways people use these in classes. Um, bri very briefly, very briefly, uh, we use AI to create stuff, both art as well as uh, text. We use AI to summarize material. 
So um, Robert and I have been having fun. He's been taking pictures of my slides and asking ChatGPT to summarize them. And it does a really good job of it. I don't mean slides with text. I mean slides that are just pictures. Um, also using AI as a collaborator, that is as a brainstorm pair uh, to ask you to help you with, or revise your ideas, to help you try and maybe cheer up or to give you a different way of approaching a problem when you're stuck. Also as a mentor, AI can work this way pretty easily to assist you in something that you don't know very well. And on top of that, this is something that's especially wild. Uh, how many of you here have ever played a role-playing game like Dungeons and Dragons? Okay, this is interesting. It's the right side again. It's just these people here. This is the only nerd section here. I don't know what's wrong with you guys, but anyway, anyway. So for the D&D &D players here, right? Um, we're talking about facilitating a role-playing game. Why, why would you do this? Check it out. I, I've asked uh, ChatGPT to help me simulate talking to a group of people at a university. And I asked it to simulate the spatial environment, to describe a bunch of academics, to have the academics pose me questions, and then let me answer the questions, and then ChatGPT assessed my answers to see how I was doing. So this went on for pages. This is just the opening, uh, opening screenshot. You can do that kind of simulation for almost anything you can think of. Not just something fun like Dungeons and Dragons, but imagine, for example, trying to do open heart surgery, or trying to pilot a plane through a storm, or trying to lead a country through a geopolitical storm. You can do this right now instead of listening to me. And this is something our students can do. This is another feature of AI. There's still more, and we have to think about some of the problems. Because when I get excited about this, you'll think, oh, this is utopia. No, 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 there are issues here, there are issues. And I want to bring some of these up because these are solid critiques. One of them is the question of academic integrity. I'm sorry, I have to mention it. But this is one that comes up all the time, where it's easy to cheat with AI. Simple. And we have no really good way of stopping it. We have some assessment adjustments, but we have no way of detecting it. That's any good. This is a big issue. We have pedagogies that can do this. And above all, as I mentioned on Thursday, we have the possibility of rethinking our assessment. That's probably in the long run the best way to proceed. But right now, this is a problem. More to the problem is that this can be inhumane. Uh, that is, we had a few students I met with earlier today who talked about how they found that AI-generated poetry was somewhat soulless, that writing became bland, that it kind of dehumanized us to use. There's also the fact that it could de-skill or replace workers, including faculty and staff. And I think this is the biggest problem right now, is the hallucination factor that uh, text box sometimes cough up silly results. Um, and we all know this, and the only people who don't know it are the ones who get caught uh, when, they, when it turns out not to work. If you haven't experienced this before, ask it a question about something that you know very well. A biography of yourself is a good one. Uh, ChatGPT sometimes places me at MIT or Harvard, which is flattering, and I enjoy that, but, you know, uh, it doesn't happen. And the other is this part here. ChatGPT doesn't think, but we treat it like it does. Humans anthropomorphize everything, animals, cars, you know, um, nations, and we also act as though it's a thinking person. But in fact, all it does is autocomplete text. It does it with extreme power and capacity. So we have to be careful that we're not misled by that. Um, this graph is almost too dense to show, um, but I want to use it to point out a couple of things. We're thinking about AI moving forward. Um, one of them is that we are facing some major decision points. One decision I want to bring up has to do with the nature of the training data set you can see in the top left. That is, tools like BARD, like Copilot, are trained on huge swaths of data. That's why they're called large language models. Those large swaths of data include a lot of copyrighted content. Some copyright owners are not happy and have been suing. So one thing that might happen is we may have court decisions that do things to generative AI. That could be an existential threat to generative AI, or it could change it into something completely different. Those suits are happening now, so we have to be prepared for it. Second thing is almost all of AI right now is done by for-profit companies. ChatGPT is built by OpenAI, which is technically a, something very strange, but it's clear that it's owned by Microsoft. What if we can have more nonprofit projects show up? Uh, so, for example, the open source platform Hugging Face hosts all kinds of creative projects where people are doing that with open source tools using public domain materials. Maybe that's a place for higher education to enter in. On top of that, this is where all of you get to play a different role. 
has to do with our cultural attitudes towards this stuff. See, we're kind of freaked out by AI. We, a lot of people use it, but we're also scared that it's going to clobber the labor market. That's not crazy, as I demonstrated. And also, that it may be inhumane, or we're afraid of the Terminator. Right? The reason I mention this is these attitudes may be goofy or ill-informed, but they're still cultural attitudes. And if people are unhappy or mad at AI, that changes how we in academia get to use it. Now, that may sound intimidating. But now I really want to intimidate you. This is the biggest challenge facing higher education in the 21st century, bar none. This is the biggest challenge arguably facing the human race right now. This is the trend, the single trend, that we have extensively documented, but that we're still trying to struggle how to handle. Uh, I'm talking about climate change, of course. What you're seeing here is a weather station in Massachusetts on the Atlantic Ocean. It's owned by the U.S. Weather Service. The reason I'm showing you this is because the U.S. Weather Service decided to give up on that station. You see the Atlantic Ocean there on the left, nibbling away at the beach, and it's going to continue to nibble, and it's going to continue to nibble higher and higher and higher. So the U.S. Weather Department, Weather Bureau had to make a decision. Do we build a wall to protect it from water? Do we put pylons underneath it to elevate it? Do we pick it up and move it somewhere? I said, it's not worth it. It's going to go, so we should basically just shut it down. So they gave it up. When we talk about um, climate change, people often accuse me of being too futuristic. I usually say, A, it's my job, but also B, um, it's not futuristic. Yeah, it's happening in the future, but it's already happening now. So this is my most recent book where I talk about this, and I just want to quickly hit some of the major topics of this, and then I want to wrap things up. Was that a question or just your head? Okay, okay. Sorry, I don't, want to, I don't want to lose you. I don't want you to lose your head either, right? So uh, when we think about climate change in higher ed, it really hits us in four or five different domains. One of them is the physical campus. And the, the more you think about this one, the more complicated it gets. So you think about campuses that are in physical danger, right? The, the campuses that are on the edge of the ocean, campuses that are on the edge of deserts, campuses that are uh, in zones that burst into flame a lot. One of the colleges that I was studying really closely actually had to clear out for a mile around its campus all the trees because they kept burning every few years. They also put a helipad on campus and cross-trained senior staff with local fire department so they could put out fires, which still happen. Right? An extreme case for now. But we also have campuses that are on the edge of tsunamis and hurricanes and so on. You get my point. So how do you respond to that? Do you harden your buildings? Do you put up a wall, a seawall? Do you move your campus? I mean, on top of that, think about where you get your electricity from. A lot of campuses around the world offshore. There's basically one cable going off campus and plugs into a utility somewhere. Uh, the one exception is actually Texas, um, where the University of Texas has its own power plant because Texas, right? Um, but do you change the sourcing of that to solar? Do you, in fact, put solar or wind turbines on your own campus? And beyond that, you think about vehicles on campus. Do they burn fossil fuels or do you switch them to electric? Do you try and encourage people to drive electric vehicles on campus? Beyond that, you can look at your food and so on. There are many, many dimensions to this. Second thing, research. What we know about climate change now is driven largely by academic research. Researchers around the world have been studying this problem. So universities and colleges play a contributory role to our understanding of this topic. Do we do more of this? Do we hire more faculty who work on this topic? And when I say the topic, by the way, climate change is not an academic department. No department owns it. I mean, you can think earth science, obviously. Environmental studies, sure. How about oceanic studies? Okay. And then you go on further and further. Chemistry, after all, describes the mechanism of global warming. You think about hydrology or studying the cryosphere. But you can take a look also at the social sciences. Psychologists have figured out a method that describes how we become nostalgic for the environment we grew up with when we were kids. They call it solastalgia. Economists study how to shift capital around the world in order to address this. Religion study scholars are looking at how religions change. And in my field, the humanities, we're the last to figure these things out. We're looking at things like how does environmental change impact history over time? How does it appear in literature? And in the arts, in communication, in photography, in journalism, they're trying to figure out how do you talk about this stuff? How do you tell this story to the world? 
Uh, the Neiman Foundation had this great article where they said that every journalist from now on has to be a climate reporter. We thought, wow, that sounds crazy, right? Said, no, 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 if you're a sports reporter, climate changes, that changes how people play sports, right? If you're a finance reporter, you gotta cover this. Politics, you see the idea. On top of this, how we teach the subject, and this is, I try not to lead with advice, but I'm gonna now. I think we can teach more about climate. And the reason is, if you poll humans around the world, you say, what do you think of climate change? Is it important or not? People over 30 say, eh, no big deal. I'm generalizing here, but we're not that excited. People under 30 are passionate about the subject, way more. Think about how old Greta Thunberg is. Think about how old Extinction Rebellion people are. That generation is off the charts with this. So it seems like an obvious thing for colleges and universities to do is to offer more classes, say in philosophy with the Anthropocene, for example, just to pick one, you know, for example. Beyond that, we also have to think about community relations. Do you, for example, come up with a partnership with a local community in order to build something? And the something might be organic garden, it might be off-campus housing that's eco-friendly, it might be a power station, it might be doing research, sending out urban studies faculty into the community to see how they respond to climate change. And beyond that, if this is the great crisis facing human civilization, as seems to be the consensus view among most of nation state leaders today, if that's true, what is the role of higher ed beyond our individual campus? Should we be working with campuses around the world to try to mitigate climate change? Should we be shifting our forces online so that we have less of a carbon footprint? Question after question comes from this, and we have to be answering these questions now while we still have time. Now this sounds terrifying and daunting, and when I talk to faculty, they usually say things like, ah, oh, I'd love to do this, but I'm too busy with A, fearing politics, B, wondering if my college is going out of business, C, wondering about X, Y, and Z, and by the way, I haven't recovered from COVID yet, I'm still tired, right? I think there are optimistic ways to think about this. There is, for example, a design movement called solar punk, which asks you to imagine a positive human experience through climate change. Not a Pollyannish one, I hope it doesn't happen, I hope it goes away, no, no, no. But how we can maximize the human experience and draw on human creativity. So for example, you will see lots of solar punk art that looks like this. This is an AI drawn solar punk university. You can see lots and lots of green trees everywhere, including the sides and tops of buildings. You can see solar, it's in the name, right? Um, solar panels everywhere. And one of the great developments of our time, by the way, is the complete collapse in the price of solar power. Solar power is cheaper than oil or gas right now. And beyond that, turning slowly, you can see wind turbines. And people, students, all among them, all throughout. Maybe this is a better version of how to live. See, these are the questions and the ideas that higher education is the best source of knowledge for on Earth. Hollywood will give you some ideas, Individual creative writers will give you some ideas, but higher education has a huge, immense intellectual horsepower across all domains. It can really chew on this. All right, I wanna wrap this up because we are gonna run out of time, but also because I'm afraid that I'm gonna fill up your brains with too much darkness. So what might happen next? What are we, given all these trends, where are, higher, where, where are colleges and universities headed? Here's one direction. Where I began by saying we want to improve quantity and quality, we still do, and there's still pressure on doing this. And I think you'll see more and more resources devoted to this, especially if the quantity of students goes down. We may see more general support for students. I mean, wraparound services, so taking care of students' mental health, spiritual health, physical health, helping them uh, with politics or their careers at a greater level, what you know, Georgetown called Cura Personalis. We may also see curricular con changes continue to happen. So allied health, by the way, this is a, a kind of technical term. Allied health refers to healthcare, the whole level of it, from psychology to nursing to pharmacy, dentistry, electronic medical, medical records, all of that. As populations age, they consume more healthcare statistically. So it seems likely that every aging population is gonna need more and more allied healthcare, which means we will probably have to teach more and more of it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see business and poli-sci both grow as we enter this VUCA period where things get more unstable and politics becomes more interesting and important to study. 
we may also see some new programs appear that we don't have a really good name for right now, such as climate change mitigation. And we also won't just grow. We may also cut, and we have to figure out what that looks like. Uh, I expect, uh, looking forward a bit, that we'll continue to digitize more and more digital experiences. Uh, I think, based on the COVID experience, we will have something like an introverted culture of a generation of students who lost a lot of socialization, and we have to help them with that. Yet another thing for higher education to do. And I expect in the United States, we will see more cuts to programs and more mergers of institutions. I expect we should also see battles over automation. Uh, the AI battle I discussed earlier has a lot of depth to it. And we're already seeing this play out on campus. You know, people saying we shouldn't use AI, people saying we should mandate it and so on. I also expect to see more climate planning. And where that usually comes from on campus is not from presidents and not from governments and not from faculty. It comes from architects and the people who have to actually run the physical plant of a campus because they are keenly aware of this. And I think this last bit here will be ever more committed to learners, to improving their experience, which is entirely a good thing. So you can think about a couple of these questions. Which of these trends are the hardest to predict? You know, which are the most unstable, the most squishy, the most chaotic? Which of these will have the biggest impact for you on your campus and your institution? And then how do you learn about all of this? And how do you share this together?